Thanks for joining us for another edition of Biotech and Life Sciences CEOs. Our guest today is R. Nolan Townsend. He's the CEO of Lexio Therapeutics. It's a company that's focusing on um, expanding the application of CRISPR gene therapies past rare diseases where they've generally been applied um, to more prevalent kinds of diseases. Lexio was founded based upon the work of uh, clinicians and scientists at Wheel Cornell and is chaired by Dr. Stephen Altshuler, who's currently a director at Ziff Capital and is formerly the co-founder of Spark Therapeutics, which of course pioneered gene therapy and uh, earned the first approval back in 2019 um, uh, for that and, and subsequently was uh, uh, merged with uh, Roche. Anyway, prior to Lexio, uh, Nolan served as Pfizer's uh, president for rare diseases, both in North America and international markets. He has a background in corporate finance, um, including in the healthcare services department at Lehman Brothers, as well as earlier roles in finance at, uh, at Pfizer. He currently serves as uh, chairman of the board of the Life Science Cares in, in New York City, and he's on the uh, board of the New York, New York City Sciences Advisory Council. He holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and did his undergraduate work at Penn. Nolan, the idea that got me so excited about our talk was the enthusiasm that you expressed on your panel um, for more widely applying genetic therapies to more common diseases, which is where all the costs and the patients live. Yeah. So before we get into specifics, I'd, I'd like to just ask you to expand upon that thought for a minute and, and kind of introduce the subject. Yeah. So first, uh, you know, thank you for, for having me. I, I think it's a, um, a set of topics I'm very passionate about. And frankly, uh, is one of the things that um, motivates me every day to kind of, uh, you know, deliver greater impact, uh, both, you know, for patients, but I, but I think you know, some of the things we're working on uh, can have a very broad impact on society and, and you know, healthcare systems and you know, how we think about the cost of healthcare, you know, over time. Um, so just, you know, taking a step back, um, I did just want to outline sort of the different types of genetic medicines that are in development and uh, how they relate to the different types of diseases that um, are out there today. So I would say in the broad category of genetic medicines, you really have three types of, of treatments. Uh, one is, as you've described, uh, CRISPR, which is typically thought of as, as gene editing. Um, via gene editing, you have the opportunity to uh, silence a, a gene that is, let's say, malfunctioning. Um, you also have the opportunity to uh, re replace a malfunctioning gene with the functioning, uh, with the functioning gene. Um, there's another type of technology called, uh, classically called gene therapy, which I would refer to as gene augmentation, where you are adding the corrected gene uh, into the cell, which expresses the functional protein, but you're not um, removing a, an existing gene, you're not replacing an existing gene, so there's a certain set of diseases that will benefit from that. And then the third type of genetic medicine that we'll probably talk about today is what's called gene silencing. Uh, so this, this is... Um, where you use um, uh, siRNA to silence the expression of a, let's say, malfunctioning uh, gene, for, for lack of better term. So I think these are the three types of uh, genetic medicines that we'll talk about today. And via these three types of genetic medicines, uh, it's my impression or my view that they can, you know, fundamentally address almost every single possible disease, disease state that that's out there, both uh, the rare and ultra rare diseases where they're focused today, but ultimately. Uh, these technologies can address um, a far broader, you know, set of disease states. So um, the website says that Lexio is using an integrated modular approach. And as you know, Nolan, I'm not a scientist. I tell everyone that, you know. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us why, you know, I know about prime editing and CAS-12, CAS-14, all that sort of thing. Um, but what do you mean by a modular approach? 
What it means is that we are squarely a, a therapeutics company, and we start with the disease in mind and then design the genetic medicine technology around the disease in order to address it. Um, so we will use the you know, route of administration, the, the vector and the, the payload sequence that best suits that particular disease or that particular indication. Um, this is as compared to a platform company, which has, I'd say, an on-the-shelf uh, technology, and they try to find diseases to which they can apply it. Um, we start from the opposite point of starting from the disease and then, you know, backing into the therapeutic option that's required to correct that disease. And so, you know, that's what integrated modular approach means to us, that we're putting together the right constructs for the disease but I think it's important for um, the context of this conversation today, um, because I, I think um, everyone has believed that um, you know ultra rare, rare monogenic diseases are, are low hanging fruit for gene therapy, and and there's a reason that that you know that that belief is out there. Um, in a lot of cases, the link between the genetics and the specific disease in question are very very clear. So you insert the gene, it expresses the functional protein. As long as you've gotten enough of the protein there in, in the respective, you know, the organ of focus, um, you should see an improvement or full correction of the disease. And so a lot of rare diseases are of that of that profile. But I think as we move to larger and potentially more complex diseases, the calculus around um, the biology of the disease, the link to the genetics, you know, what biomarkers do we need to look at to show correction of the disease? These things become, you know, a lot more complex. Um, and an example of that is Alzheimer's disease, which is an area that we're working on from a, a gene therapy perspective. There are a number of different biomarkers that are you know, cu currently associated with Alzheimer's disease. And there's a view that there could be several different pathogenic mechanisms that are involved with the disease. So we've heard a lot about these uh, amyloid uh, clearing antibodies. So lecanemab, which was the recently approved therapy is an amyloid antibody. Um, and there's, you know, there, there are others out there as well. Um, they, these are viewed to be focused on a single pathogenic mechanism of the disease. So while they do have an effect, I think the view of many experts is that they're unlikely to treat the totality of this very complex disease, um, which is where, in our view, you know, genetic medicine in, enters the picture and that this allows us to go upstream and treat the genetics of the disease, which we expect to then have a downstream impact on multiple different pathogenic mechanisms simultaneously. But in order to demonstrate that that effect, in order to uh, in, in be you know competitive with therapies that are you know a bit downstream of genetic medicines, we need to ensure we have uh, the right route of administration, the right vector construct, and the right payload at the right dose in order to correct the disease uh, in the with the effect size that we're seeking. And so that's an important theme for us as a company as we embark on treating, you know, ever larger um, diseases with, uh, with gene therapy. So how do you choose the diseases at this point, Nolan? Yeah. So I, I'd say it's very different based on the, the target, the target organ. And as a company, we started with uh, central nervous system diseases like Alzheimer's disease. We've also started with genetic uh, cardiovascular diseases. And one of the big um, things we look at both on one side, we're interested to address diseases that will have an impact on patients, meaning there's high met need for patients individually. We're also interested in having a broader healthcare system-wide or societal impact with the type of diseases we're focused on, which typically means, you know, that they are larger diseases by prevalence, uh, you know, in, in society. But with that as the context, we also need to think about the technical feasibility of uh, gene therapy and its ability to actually fundamentally address this disease. And so as an example uh, in the brain, um, in, in all organs, you have what's called intracellular proteins and you have secreted proteins. And these are very different uh, by, by profile. Um, we believe that the delivery technology for genetic medicines to the brain uh, may not yet be sufficient to fundamentally treat a lot of the intracellular, pro intracellular um, mediated diseases of the brain. Um, and so, you know, an example that I would give is uh, in, in Friedrich's ataxia, this is an intracellular protein, which means in order to correct the disease, you need to transduce every single cell in a certain region of the brain in order to see an effect. With the secreted protein, you only need to transduce a certain percentage of the cells 
those cells will express the functional protein and that functional protein will, will float throughout, uh, throughout the brain and, and the, and the, um, and, and, and the, um, and cerebrospinal fluid as well. And so those have a different technical feasibility hurdle, I would say each, each of those. And so for the brain, we focused on only secreted proteins, uh, proteins where we think we, by adding gene therapy in the right amount, it will express the protein and then it can correct the disease. And for example, we have not selected intracellular protein. So that's an example of a decision on disease selection that's based on you know, technical feasibility, but it just so happens that this APOE gene, the one we're focused on for Alzheimer's disease, is a secreted protein. So we've been able to uh, transduce the brain, uh, get a level of protein expression uh, that we think is having a fundamental effect on Alzheimer's disease today. Um, we have a bit of a different set of criteria for, you know, cardiovascular diseases, with, which I can go through. It's um, not based on intracellular or, um, or, or secreted. It's more based on the amount of absolute protein you need to correct the disease in question, which comes back to the dose. Um, but I would just say that that technical feasibility um, calculus is something we, we think about for all of the, you know, potential diseases that we're focused on. So to some degree, is it a, it's a de-risking mechanism? That, that's correct. I mean, it, it is the, the question of the likelihood of the animal data that we produce in our preclinical studies, you know, to translate clinically. And I think we see a lot of examples of, you know, companies, researchers, academics that are able to cure uh, diseases in mice. And right. once it gets into humans, you know, um, uh, obviously it, it may not have the same effect. And so we try to look at what are the factors which could cause that translation from uh, animals to humans to not um, play out in the way we expect. And uh, topics such as biodistribution, delivery, these are important topics for uh, the genetic medicine field. Um, so that's a, a significant area of where we focus is on biodistribution, delivery, dose, um, safety, these types of things are you know, front and center. But yes, it, it's a de-risking approach, uh, hopefully increasing the likelihood that we'll see um, in humans what we saw in the animal studies. So you mentioned delivery and safety. You're an AAV company. That's right. Why AAVs are, as opposed to some alternative method? Yeah. So for, you know, for the moment, uh, for the for the organs we're focused on, which is the brain and the heart, uh, AAV vectors are the most efficient you know, delivery system for any genetic payload to both organs. Um, I think it's still a very efficient delivery system for the liver, uh, but there are other you know, delivery systems uh, you know, emerging, delivery technologies such as lipid nanoparticle, Galnac and others. Um, so I think increasingly the liver um, will have non-viral um, approaches to deliver genetic payloads. Uh, but for the moment in the brain and, and in the in the heart, uh, AAV is still the most efficient way to get there. So I think for the next several years, um, if you want to see a, a substantial you know, clinical benefit uh, for a CNS disease or for a cardiac disease, um, and you're you know, utilizing a genetic medicine in order to see that benefit, you're probably going to be using AAV to do it. Now, that may not always be the case. Uh, we will begin to see, or likely we'll begin to see... Um, you know, non-viral approaches to delivering genetic payloads to both organs, you know, over time. But I think that's going to take a couple of years to develop. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we think there are a lot of patients out there that need treatments, which we can deliver, you know, via AAV vectors. I, I know there's a perception out there related to AAV safety. So I, I do want to address that because um, you yeah, raised it in, in your comment. Um, the, the safety of AAV is, in my view, very much linked to the dose at which the AAV vector is applied. So these safety events that we've seen with gene therapy, whether they're in, you know, the myotubular myopathy study, whether they're in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, these have all been at doses that are among the highest, you know, viral loads ever administered into the human body. Um, so the DMD study where we saw the patient death, this was um, at a dose higher than one E14 um, vector genomes per kilogram, and these are adults. So that's that's one with 14 zeros behind it times the body weight of the of the patient. And the same for the myotubular myopathy studies. I think if you look uh, and you sort of draw a line at one E14 and lower, 
it would be notable for gene therapy almost in the absence of safety events. And you see with, um, you know, the hemophilia studies, you see with the number of other of these approved gene therapies, um, you see very compelling results from an eff efficacy perspective, but you see very few, you know, safety, safety events. And this idea that there is a limiting dose in gene therapy actually is a new concept. Even if you look back, you know, two years, three years ago, I don't think we knew that if you go substantially above, you know, 1E14 vector genomes per kilogram, you would begin to see the type of safety issues that we've seen over the last couple of years. So I think this is just new knowledge for the field. And, you know, we're, we've worked our way through it. I think we're at the end of the, you know, at the kind of end of the tunnel here. And we do have a good understanding of um, what doses result in what types of side effects. And um, I, I think the field has adapted uh, to, you know, to address that. So it sounds like sort of, dose selection for you has to be really important. And I would think, and forgive me, again, I'm not a scientist, um, but that in CNS, you would require larger than average doses. Is that, what, am, where am I wrong there? Well, so so the it's it's really a function of the uh, what I would say the compartment. So in the CNS, the compartment is the brain and the cerebral spinal fluid. So the compartment is relatively small. When you're dosing uh, a, a patient for diseases that are like skeletal muscle, liver, heart, you're you're basically dosing the systemic compartment. So the whole body except except the brain and the spinal cord. So you do need a lot more vector there. In totality, in order to you know get the right biodistribution for that uh, you know the, the set of organs uh, that are in the systemic compartment. So, typically, um, if you were to think about the different you know organ targets for for gene therapy, um, the eye would requires the least. Right. Um, there's also some uh, genetic medicines for um, for hearing loss. Those don't require uh, that much vector as well. It's again, it's uh, the compartment small. Uh, the you know the brain is next. And then the systemic compartment requires the most. And so that's sort of the typical um, uh, cadence of, in terms of the absolute dose uh, for, for gene therapy. Um, and as you have probably seen, a lot of the early gene therapies focused on the eye because it didn't need as much vector. They focused in on the brain because it de didn't need as much vector. And I think not until some of the manufacturing technology that's recently evolved have you know, has the systemic compartment at the doses that are required for a lot of these diseases really become a feasible target for gene therapy in a reasonable, you know, at a reasonable level of cost from a manufacturing standpoint. So um, I think the technology there is advancing quickly. And I think we'll begin to see, you know, an increasing number of gene therapies for uh, whether it's cardiac, you know, liver, or kidney, you know, and so on over time because of this uh, advancement in the ma manufacturing technology, which also comes back to the point we began discussing, um, which is, you know, today we're focused on ultra rare diseases, uh, uh, thousands of patients. Um, but in order to get to the point where we can treat uh, increasingly less rare diseases, you know, the manufacturing technology needs to catch up so that we can efficiently treat, you know, 100,000 patients or 500,000 patients, you know, with gene therapy. And I, I think, you know, the manufacturing technology will get there. Uh, but today it, it's, you know, right at the point where um, it still needs a, a bit more optimization in order to be ready for uh, diseases like Alzheimer's. Okay. Let's talk about Friedrich's atax ataxia for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, it's a progressive degenerative genetic disease that affects, I think, like 8,000 people in the U.S. And roughly 5,600 of them will develop some kind of cardiomyopathy um, during yeah. their period with the disease. And, and that apparently proves to be the ultimate cause of death, right? That's correct. So, so tell us about your work and, and uh, the disease itself and that sort of thing, please. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it's it's a, um, you know, very challenging disease, uh, you know, life-threatening disease. The typical life expectancy of a patient uh, with Friedrich's ataxia is 30 to 40, you know, years. Um, there's a neurologic component of the disease that develops uh, typically in childhood. These are when you know, patients are, you know, between five and 10 years old. It starts with, you know, gait abnormality and, and a certain, you know, clumsiness that's observed. 
Um, but this typically progresses um, until a form of cardiomyopathy associated with the disease develops. Um, and this typically develops uh, in adulthood, but it's actually this cardiac disease that's the cause of death for up to 70% of Friedrich's ataxia patients. Um, so while addressing the neurologic symptoms can certainly improve you know, the patient's quality of life, you can really only impact mortality in Friedrich's ataxia uh, by addressing the cardiac component of the disease. Now, the, the first treatment for, uh, for Friedrich's ataxia was approved actually just uh, a, a couple of months ago. And this treatment's focused on the neurologic component of the disease. It's from a company called Riata. Um, and I think one of the challenges historically and why we've only seen the first treatment for FA in the last couple of months is that a lot of drug developers have attempted to correct both the, both the uh, neurologic and cardiac component of the disease simultaneously, which as we talked about technical feasibility earlier, this is a very technically challenging target for any modality, whether it's small molecules, uh, biologics, or, or genetic medicines. And so in our view, we need to break this disease you know, into its components. Um, there is now a treatment for the neurologic component of the disease, which should hopefully slow the progression uh, but it won't, it shouldn't impact the cardiac disease or it's unlikely to impact the cardiac disease. So in our view, there are patients who have, um, you know, continue to have neurologic function into adulthood, but they would want to benefit from an extended life expectancy associated with uh, hopefully, you know, correcting or slowing the progression of the cardiac disease. So that's why we decided to focus on the cardiovascular component of Friedrich's ataxia first. We are in an ongoing phase one, two study, uh, looking, uh, addressing uh, that uh, component of the disease. We've completed our um, enrollment of our first dose cohort. We're currently enrolling our second dose cohort. Um, and, and so it should hopefully be a treatment that has a lot of value for the Friedrich's ataxia patient community as we move it closer to our later stage studies and into, into a BLA. But the other uh, benefit of this is it's a, you know, it's a first proof of concept of, of the application of our therapeutic platform to a cardiovascular disease. So our ability to show uh, improvement and correction in Friedrich's ataxia will really give a nice read through to a number of other uh, genetic cardiovascular diseases that we can, that we believe we can address with the same, you know, gene therapy platform. Uh, so behind it, we have a therapy uh, treating arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which is another, you know, life-threatening disease. These patients um, ha will have, you know, typ typically sudden death events, uh, similar to what a lot of us saw on the uh, football field during the, during the Buffalo Bills game uh, last, you know, last football season. This is the type of uh, arrhythmic event that um, that an uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy patient would experience. You know, we have a gene therapy that's in the late stages of preclinical development to address that disease. And there are a number of others beyond this that we believe our platform can address. And so the FA program is not only, in our view, an important treatment for these patients that are suffering from this challenging disease, uh, but it is also a validation of the platform and approach that we're taking for applying genetic medicines to, uh, you know, to cardiovascular diseases. So with the, with the, um, the approval uh, of the of this CNS tack on on Friedrichs, um, would you say that it, was that undertaken first because it was easier, or why do you think that happened? Yeah, I th I think so. I think the um, you know the the focus historically. I mean, Friedrich, it, you know, it's an ataxia. It's 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 kind of its name almost exudes that it's a neurologic disease. And so I think that, you know, much more from, a, you know, from just from an observational standpoint, I think a lot of people will see um, if you, you know, meet an FA patient, you'll see very clearly uh, the neurologic disease. And these patients are treated by neurologists, they're followed by neurologists from, you know, five years old. Um, but I think it's not until recently that the role of the cardiovascular disease was more clearly recognized. And, and the cardiologists have become, you know, a bit more vocal in the Friedrich's ataxia, you know, treatment landscape. And until, you know, the, the role of a cardiologist sort of were, you know, was, was enhanced in, in the treatment course, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on the best ways in which to treat the cardiovascular disease. So I think 
you know, a lot of the development, uh, drug development in um, Friedrich's ataxia has just been led by neurologists or, you know, academics with neurologic backgrounds, and they've typically focused on that component of the disease. But, you know, that that's definitely changing. I mean, our, our therapy is changing it. You know, there's some others out there that are thinking about it as well. Um, but I think that's just the history of the field and, and sort of, you know, the, the legacy of where these patients were treated um, since the, you know, since childhood. See, okay. So Lexi has also received a orphan drug designation uh, for LX1004, I think, yeah. uh, which is in uh, CLN2 Batten disease. Can yeah. you tell us about that disease and, and your approach to that one? Yeah. So, um, you know, Batten disease is, a, is an ultra rare a lysosomal storage disease um, and in you know, a deficiency of this uh, protein tripeptidyl peptidase is the cause of the disease. It's actually a very classic uh, lysosomal storage disease and that, you know, deficiency of the protein is the cause of the, of the disease. It's been demonstrated that by simply um, reintroducing this protein in the right amounts, um, you can achieve a uh, pretty substantial reduction in the rate of progression of, of the disease. And so uh, BioMarin has a approved uh, enzyme replacement therapy for uh, Batten disease out there today. It's, it's administered through a, um, uh, through a reservoir in the brain for patients uh, starting, you know, starting with pediatric patients. Um, our gene therapy approach is simply to deliver the uh, corrected uh, gene, C CLN2 gene to the brain in the right amount, which expresses the functional protein and hopefully would, would achieve a level of correction uh, that that's, you know, would be similar to what's seen with the existing therapies. Um, we've completed a phase one study associated with this, uh, this gene therapy. We've shown a, a statistically significant reduction in the rate of decline of this disease versus two natural history control groups. So we did reach clinical proof of concept in that, in that study. And the next step for this would be a, a pivotal study um, evaluating this therapy for, um, you know, in, in a broader set of patients, probably at a bit higher dose than what was used in the phase one. Um, however, you know, as a company, uh, and as we started with, we're, you know, um, we've kind of oriented our focus on, you know, larger rare diseases or non-rare diseases. And so we are, you know, actively seeking a, a partner that has expertise in the ultra rare uh, gene therapy area to work with us on, uh, applying this therapy into that disease area and into that patient population. So, you know, more to come on that, but that's likely the direction we go with this program is, is via uh, working with the partner to uh, advance it. I see. Okay. So let's talk about the big one now. Um, you know, recently there's been a lot of success um, in terms of the amyloid plaque with the um, um, Biogen and, and Lily just uh, unveiled their phase three study uh, just the other day in Alzheimer's. Um, but your approach is completely different. Yeah. So let's kind of, maybe let's get into the weeds a little bit on what your approach is, um, why uh, in terms of your mission uh, to, to uh, attack more common diseases, you happen to uh, um, choose probably the most problematic one <laughs> um, and yeah. uh, and and what your thoughts are there. Yeah, so I'll start just with some background on um, the genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease because I, I don't think this is well known, but it's a very important uh, co component to you know all drug development in Alzheimer's and and ultimately actually the the effect that these therapies that are developing may have you know for patients with this disease. So, uh, we all have a gene called called ApoE. It's apolipoprotein E. Uh, it's the protein is a cholesterol transporter. Um, there's three different uh, isoforms. There's ApoE threes, which most of us are. It's about eighty percent of the population. ApoE fours, which uh, represent about you know fifteen percent of the population, and then ApoE twos, which are a single digit uh, percentage of the population. Uh, now, if you were an ApoE4, especially an ApoE4 with uh, what, what's called a homozygote, so two alleles of ApoE4, one inherited from your father, one from your mother, um, your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease is 15 to 20 times higher than that of an ApoE3. So it's 15 to 20 times higher than that of 
of a, of a non ApoE4 uh, carrier. And so that's a very high you know, risk factor of the disease and, and the um, Alzheimer's population uh, could be as many as 50% of patients with Alzheimer's have one ApoE4 allele. So it's highly enriched uh, in terms of the, the patients who ultimately develop the disease. So interestingly, however, if you're an ApoE2, the existence of the ApoE2 gene removes the ApoE4 risk. So if you're a heterozygote, one allele E2, one allele E4, your risk profile goes back to normal. So this is the thinking behind our program, that we're actually delivering the ApoE2 gene to the central nervous system of ApoE4 homozygotes, where they're by seeking to alter their CNS to be closer to E2, E4 heterozygotes. Um, and we're you know, fundamentally using ApoE2 as a therapeutic which we believe can stop or slow, you know, many of the pathogenic processes that are currently associated with Alzheimer's disease. And I say what differentiates this from, you know, the existing approaches like lecanemab and others is that actually we're treating the genetics of the disease rather than a specific pathogenic mechanism of the disease. So in the view of many experts, the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's is multivariate, whether it be amyloid involved, tau protein, neuroinflammation, blood brain barrier disorder, there's a potentially a number of pathogenic mechanisms involved. And the current treatment approaches may only address one component of that pathogenic mechanism. So they're only amyloid treatments, or they're only tau treatments. What we're doing is going upstream, treating the genetics of the disease, which we expect to have a downstream impact on multiple different pathogenic mechanisms you know, simultaneously. Um, so this is the thinking behind the program. But what's important, I think, for Alzheimer's disease, beyond the ability to treat this totality of the disease, is that um, obviously this is a disease that will have a substantial cost burden for, you know, for society. And the ability to have a single administration possible, you know, functional cure for the disease um, will have substantial value for, you know, this population and for, you know, the healthcare system, you know, broadly. Now, we're currently in a phase one, two study. Uh, we will complete enrollment of the study this year. We've read out data um, last year from our lowest dose. We showed via this data um, a reduction in several of the biomarkers that are commonly associated with Alzheimer's disease versus baseline. So we saw a reduction in tau, phospho tau, amyloid beta. The reductions that we saw in tau were similar to the reductions that lecanemab saw um, and we saw these already at our lowest dose. So, you know, it's a, uh, you know, phase one, a small set of patients, it's not powered, you know, and so on as, as you would say, but but I think, you know, some of the early signals uh, are, are very promising and, and we're excited about them. So who are the potential patients here? Are they early Alzheimer's patients? In which case you're trying for a cure or is it uh, preventative? You have yeah, a test, you find that you have the, you know, APOE4 and you go in for treatment. How does that work? Yeah, good good question. So right now the therapy is focused on, um, you know, patients who have symptoms of the disease, um, anywhere from mild cognitive impairment to moderate dementia. So that, you know, on the, on the earlier end of the disease progression, uh, where we think it will have the most substantial, uh, you know, clinical benefit. However, the point you raise is, is a good one and one we, you know, talk about a lot that this, you know, particular modality for this particular patient population, you know, could have an application as a, a pre-symptomatic uh, treatment that we could take a ApoE4 homozygotes, which if you convert their odds ratios from this 20% higher likelihood, I think they're, they're likely, you know, 90% of ApoE4s are likely to have uh, develop Alzheimer's disease in their life in their lifetime. So it's a pretty high penetrance of the disease for patients with that that genetic profile. That if you were treated uh, um, presymptomatically with the gene therapy and ultimately never develop the disease, this would obviously, you know, be something that could be attractive for patients of that profile. So I think we have to demonstrate that the treatment is safe and efficacious. Uh, first in patients, um, and that's kind of a um, you know a hurdle we we have to have to meet here. But I think once we do meet that hurdle, um, there's obviously and and will be the possibility to consider developing this program for uh, you know for presymptomatic uh, presymptomatic patients. And and ultimately, I think that's the kind of thing that will benefit society the most. To be to be honest, is that 
um, you know, patients never actually develop Alzheimer's disease rather than treating a disease once, you know, once, once it emerges. So I think this preventative approach, you know, does lend itself to genetic medicines because it's not as if you need to go every week for an infusion or take a pill every day. This would be a single administration, um, you know, single administration therapy, and hopefully you never develop the disease. And so that's the kind of thing we're really excited about, the application of genetic medicines in that kind of context. So you're going to, in the next phase, escalate the dose? How many patients? Yeah, we're um, we're in our fourth dose cohort. So this will be the highest dose. We're uh, beginning to enroll this cohort uh, within this quarter. Um, so this dose would be in the, uh, say, 1E14 total genomes dose range, uh, which is not, you know, there, there are higher doses that have been used in CNS gene therapy. Um, and we would expect a complete enrollment of the study this year, and we would expect to have a data readout of all four cohorts of patients um, in, in 2024. And, you know, via this data readout, we'll get have an opportunity to demonstrate if the addition of the APOE2 gene in the right amounts is having a fundamental impact on these biomarkers that are commonly associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we did show that at our low dose. We hope to show a similar trend or hopefully even better in, in our higher doses. And you, I think you're intending to follow the patients for four years thereafter, right? That's correct. So That's correct. This, this is a pivotal trial that you can take the, to the FDA for an NDA or? No, this is a, a phase one, two study. Uh, we would still uh, envision there needs to be a, what's called a controlled study of some kind uh, that would be registrational. So whether that's a phase two or a phase three, we would envision a larger controlled study to be likely what the pathway we would need to take, you know, for an approval. Uh, but what this will do is show us uh, the the effect size. So by adding gene therapy at this dose, you know, what level of reduction of amyloid, tau, phosphatau, other biomarkers are we seeing? And we can look at the correlation of those um, uh, responses in the biomarkers to certain cognitive decline endpoints and which would al allow us to power the study. So in effect, what I'm describing is, you know, getting to what is the size of that pivotal study that can ultimately get us to, to the approval. Uh, the data that comes out of the phase one will, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll show that, uh, we'll, we'll demonstrate that. And, and one of the problems with the Biogen study in particular, and, and maybe with the Lilly um, drug, I guess they haven't priced it yet, but has been this this uh, denial um, uh, at CMS of yeah. reimbursement. Yeah. Um, would you anticipate that your approach might be less expensive in total because it's a one and done? Yeah, I think so. I think if you look over a patient's lifetime, it's and and you know we've not we're we're not close to pricing the yeah, therapy sure. yet, and we need to. No, understand the effect of, of the therapy and and you know where the Alzheimer's treatment landscape is at that point in time. But but theoretically, a once and done therapy, if you look over a sufficient number of years, uh, should should be less expensive than an antibody that you need to be in, uh, dosed with, you know, every week or every month or you know whatever period of time for the you know for the balance of a patient's life. Um, and I think, in my view, and this is my opinion, I'm sharing is that genetic medicine should be priced that way, that they should over time uh, save, you know, costs for the healthcare system relative to other treatment options that are, you know, that are out there. Um, now, it may be that that cost savings isn't realized until you're six or you're seven or years like that, but um, it, it ultimately should uh, re reduce costs for the healthcare system. And I think this is fundamentally what therapies like genetic medicines can can add and can can really result in substantial changes for society and for the healthcare system by thinking about things that way. And you know, to date, the genetic medicines, the, the ones that have been launched and priced, they have thought about um, they have thought about their pricing strategy in that way. Uh, the hemophilia B treatment uh, that, that Unicure had approved, is priced in a way where I, I think at year six or year seven, it becomes cost neutral. And then beyond that, for these patients, for the rest of their life, 
they've they've been this disease is in effect been removed from society's balance sheet from a cost perspective. So I think that that's you know the right way to think about pricing in genetic medicines. I think where we run into challenges is in disease areas where there is no existing treatment, and what's the right place to set you know the the, the cost benchmark in in those instances. And I think we have a couple of those that are you know that are developing now. But I think for Alzheimer's, our expectation would be that um, at, at the right point in time, over the right time frame, this therapy would um, save costs for society relative to other, you know, other modalities. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I saw an article, I think it was in STAT the other day, that um, some researchers at Duke were also attacking the APOE4. Yeah. And, and do you know about their work? And, and um, is there any difference between the way that they're doing it versus you're doing it? Or... Yeah. Are you working with them, maybe, or no, we're not working with them. What they're what they're working on doing is, as far as I understood, was silencing the APOE4 gene while not while while not impacting the expression of the APOE3 gene. So it looked like their strategy is focused on what's called APOE4 heterozygote. So one allele of E4 and one allele of E3, and they're just looking to silence the E4 allele, which is producing this toxic uh, protein, which is causing you know Alzheimer's disease. Um, why it's different, one, um, we are adding the E2 gene, not silencing the E4 gene. Um, and we're also working on APOE4 homozygotes who have two alleles of APOE4. Um, so a silencing approach for those patients wouldn't work because then they would have no APOE protein. And so the, you know, the, the transport of cholesterol, it, it, you know, could lead to a disease state you know, that could be worse than Alzheimer's disease, you know, from a, a speed of progression point of view. So um, for a E4 homozygotes, we have to find a way to, uh, you know, correct their likelihood or symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but do so in a way where we don't completely rid their brain of the APOE protein. Um, so that's why a different um, uh, therapeutic approach is required for those patients and what uh, the group at Duke is doing. Um, you know, there are others working on uh, approaches around APOE. I know I read that the, the Broad Institute, David Liu's lab may be working on something there as well. Um, so there are others out there. Um, ours is the most advanced uh, program. So I think some of the clinical data we're producing uh, will, you know, provide interesting guidance to the rest of the field for the therapies they're developing. And like I say, I mean, we'll, we'll all learn from each other. Um, so it's, you know, it's a competition, but it's a friendly competition. And I think we can all benefit um, from all of the research that's uh, developing across the field. You know, I wanted to ask you, because I don't get many people on, on the uh, show with a financial background. And the industry has experienced, um, let's say, a setback in the last year and a half with the drain of liquidity. Yeah. How do you see the industry going forward, dealing with um, with uh, these higher rates and, and uh, um, less available cash, an IPO market that doesn't exist, um, yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah. So, you know, I think the, the thing to me that's, um, you know, just taking a step back, I mean, the thing that's interesting, if you look at the total, um, uh, you know, spending on research and development for you know, for therapeutics, about a third of it comes from, you know, governments and academic institutions like the NIH and, and universities. A third of it comes, uh, you know, from from pharma, um, and a third of it comes from, you know, pre-revenue biotech companies, companies like like Lexio Therapeutics. And so, I think the uh, you know the NIH and the academic uh, investment into R and D is likely to remain roughly stable. I mean, there could be some changes, but they may not be material. I think the research and development that the pharma companies are, uh, you know, sort of investing into is likely to remain, you know, relatively stable because these are all revenue generating companies and they're just redeploying their revenue back into R&D. And it actually, you know, recently the R&D, the, the revenues for the pharma companies have grown substantially because of COVID vaccines and uh, some of these GLP-1 uh, treatments for, you know, for weight loss, these diabetic treatments. Um, so I think there could even be more spending on R&D um, for uh, within the pharma uh, universe. And so what we're talking here about are the pre-revenue uh, biotech companies, which are uh, beholden to the capital markets for, uh, for the most part, beholden to the capital markets 
for all of their you know, research and, and development spending. So as the capital markets, uh, as, as liquidity is reduced, as investors become you know, more risk averse, you would typically see um, less money going into research and development for pre-revenue, you know, biotech companies. But you know what's interesting is happening is you know not every program deserves to be developed in the first place. And so I think you know what's what's happening now is these the the attrition rate of programs or programs that are being shelved or discontinued is happening a lot faster than it would have happened in other economic cycles. Uh, people would have just said, you know, let's continue the study. Let's see where this goes. We have the money to do it. I think that's no longer the case. I think boards and management teams are being a lot tougher on um, what they actually choose to develop and, and what they don't. Now, you know, what that means is, you know, hopefully the medicines that are the most promising are continuing to be developed. Um, and if something isn't developed inside of a biotech company, they would typically go to a pharma company and say, would you know, to partner with them, to work with them, to use that the capital from pharma to get the asset across the goal line. So hopefully we don't see many assets that are of high value and high impact for patients of a given disease. Hopefully we don't see a lot of these fall through the cracks, but that may happen. You know, there may be some that do fall through the cracks. But I think what we will see is just a faster recognition of you know, programs that just have, you know, potentially less value financially from a net present value standpoint, or programs that just need to be discontinued because they're not showing the results. Um, they're not showing the results that that the company or its investors are looking for. So I think that's happening and, and that will happen. And I think on, on, on balance, probably the impact, uh, hopefully the impact isn't that substantial of this financial downturn. But there is one place where I do foresee an impact. And I think this is in the ultra rare disease area, you know, because I mentioned this financial threshold for developing a drug. Um, it it changes as as liquidity changes. So as the cost of capital goes up, your your threshold for return also needs to go up in order to justify raising money at that higher cost of capital. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you do, when you run that math, there's a lot of ultra rare diseases that just based on the size of the population. Um, that you would ultimately commercialize a therapy into just may not meet that economic hurdle to take capital at this very high cost of capital and apply it into research for this disease, especially given, you know, the risk profile, you know, and so on. So my concern is that, um, you know, there are 7,000 rare diseases out there, less than, you know, 10% of them have treatment. So there's, you know, call it 6,000, you know, rare diseases out there that don't have treatments. Um, in a market like this, you will see fewer and fewer companies researching treatments or cures for ultra rare diseases. And this will be a problem for the, you know, millions of people out there, um, both individuals with the disease, their children, their families, you know, and, and so on. Um, so this is something that I think does need to be considered. And I know the FDA has begun to think about it, uh, but I do think there needs to be some framework put in place to address uh, that because that will be a um, that will be a symptom or byproduct of this market. You will just see fewer treatments for some of these ultra rare diseases. Interesting. And so I wonder, um, with the uh, negotiation that's about to happen in small molecules, if you've seen any movement um, in terms of capital investment from the small molecule space to others um, like genetic research. Absolutely. I, and, and I think some companies are openly um, mentioning the, the therapies that they're not, that they don't plan to develop because of the inflation reduction act. Um, you know, it obviously for a company in gene therapy, it's of less impact for us, but I think we definitely can, can see and feel these distortions that are being created in the market today. And you can see those pretty far downstream in, in preclinical development and clinical development and the types of companies that are, um, you know, that, that are being financed and the types of programs that investors are actually interested in that is being impacted by, um, by the Inflation Reduction Act, as is the types of programs that the pharma companies are interested in partnering with biotech to, you know, to develop. They're they're just less interested in programs that will be impacted by the Inflation Reduction Act. So um, it is it is having an impact, and it will have a continued impact. Um, and you know, I, I just hope we can come to some you know viable solution for you know how to ensure an adequate amount of investment goes into. 
um, you know, goes into drug development to treat some of these very challenging diseases. And then, and then I wonder, you know, I always think that that politicians involved in in healthcare should be forced to go to two scientific conferences a year and meet the people. Yeah, because they'd find that the people. Um, aren't they all that interested in getting rich? Yeah. They're a yeah. lot more interested in patients. And yet, you know, you have this um, this issue. And, and what I want to ask you about specifically is, is uh, uh, the FTC with, with Amgen and, and Horizon. Yeah. Um, that's how biotech has financed itself. Well, since I've been reading it, which is the 90s, so yeah. that's 40 years. Um, you know, it, we want to, um, we have a moonshot to, to cure cancer on one hand, and um, we're sort of uh, um, cutting off our nose to spite our face on the other. Do yeah. you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, probably the concern that, you know, emerges is, um, we, we want increased competition uh, in order to fuel development of more medicines and ultimately, you know, competition commercially results in prices decreasing over time. So if there's less competition and there's bigger pharma companies out there, then, you know, will that r result in prices uh, that, that don't decrease as quickly as, as in a different landscape? And so I, maybe the concern is that, you know, with this consolidation, do you have decreased competition? I think it, 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 in my view, it's a, it's it's a bit misguided because you know the the technology cycles in this industry are are are, are very fast. I mean, I, I say it's on a relative basis. I mean, if you compared it to, you know, semiconductors, I mean, the technology cycles are a lot faster. Here we're running human clinical trials; those can only run at a certain speed. But the technology cycles are fast, so we have entire you know modalities, treatment modalities that will be entirely replaced with new treatment modalities and and I'm you know referring here to I'm you know genetic medicines as I you know we've been discussing these can completely replace some of the protein therapies that are out there today can completely replace some of the um small molecules that are out there today and these are being developed by small companies I mean this you know Lexio is a 50 person company that's developing treatments uh that will be in competition with you know, two hundred billion dollar companies today. So it doesn't require, it doesn't necessarily require size and scale to develop a novel to develop a novel therapy. Now, it may require size and scale to commercialize that therapy, and that's where this kind of M and A story, you know, comes together. But ultimately, the ability to consolidate a number of therapies onto a single commercial platform should lead to lower drug prices. Because what it means is that, you know, Lexio may not have to develop a duplicative sales and marketing organization to some larger company. And instead, we just, you know, work with the larger company. And so there's only one set of costs that are being incurred to um, distribute the drug. And um, and therefore, theoretically, from a profit and loss perspective, it's, it's more efficient. So I actually think, you know, it provided there's no... Um, uh, you know, no limitations from a you know antitrust point of view in in respect to what's done on the R and D side to to have these uh, mergers and consolidations for uh, you know later stage commercial type companies actually makes a lot of sense. It it should reduce costs. It's it's taking cost capacity out of the system and and uh, ensuring that um, that that it's these drugs are efficiently delivered to you know to patients. So so that's my you know that's my perspective. I agree that that's the way. Uh, the biotech sector finances itself. It's also how capital is recycled. So as a biotech company is sold to a pharma, that capital goes back to the biotech investors. They then invest in the next, they invest in the next set of um, a, a biotech companies developing novel treatments. And that's how, you know, the sector has worked, you know, historically. So I, I think that that's a model that, you know, should continue. I don't, I don't see any reason why we should create barriers to that type of activity, you know, occurring. Um, and so, that, you know, I think that that's just something we need to think about as we uh, consider regulation in the field. And and it's so telling because, you know, um, 
Operation Warp Speed, Moderna needed the money. They couldn't do the research without the money. But Pfizer didn't take the money. They didn't need the money. So um, I think it's really important to note. And um, um, I guess I'm trying to, to uh, uh, stir up a grassroots campaign about it. I don't know. But um, anyway, yeah. Nolan, you're the first person I've talked with and the first company I've read anything about trying to take it, trying to apply genetics to bigger diseases. And I think that takes a lot of courage um, because it's difficult to begin with. You've chosen the most difficult disease um, to begin with. And so I, I I want to just, just ask you, kind of in closing, what's your dream here? Because you're a finance guy who found himself now at a, you know, a startup. What's yeah. your dream here? And what does it mean for people? Yeah, I, I have a vision where, you know, genetic medicines fundamentally change society. You know, and, and my concern is always, as, as an industry, are we delivering more innovation to society than what it's willing to absorb? And I think, you know, when society says these drugs are too expensive for us or we're not willing to pay for them, that society effectively pushing back on the, the cost of innovation for our industry. Right. But I, I, I think what, what we may have missed as an industry is that we actually have the technology at our fingertips that can cure some of these diseases, remove them from the you know balance sheet of society forever. Right. And I think. My vision is that. My vision is that we look forward 20 years from now, the top 10, the top 20 biopharmaceutical products, the, the majority of them are genetic medicines. These have cured some of the diseases that we talk about you know, frequently. These have moved those off. You know, people are living longer, they're living healthier, um, and genetic medicines have played the role in these cures. And I think it will increase society's trust of the biopharmaceutical industry because they will think, they're actually here for my best interest. They want me to be disease free, um, but it will also over time, over the right period of time, should actually result in decreasing healthcare costs. And I haven't seen many um, initiatives, or efforts, you know, many ideas that can have as fundamental and substantial of an impact on uh, reducing healthcare costs as the potential of, of genetic medicines. And so I don't think people have looked at it that way, but if you look over the right period of time, it should definitely be the case. And so that's my, that's my dream. And I hope to see this, you know, within my lifetime. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, today. Nolan. I, I really enjoyed talking with you and, and uh, I hope to talk with you again, as I follow your progress. I do that every six months or so. And um, so I'd like to follow up with you and uh, hear about your success. That's, a, that's great. Thank you so much. Have a, have a great thank day. You. Thanks for tuning in to the Life Sciences and Biotech Podcast. We'll see you in the next episode. The information contained in this website and podcast are purely informational and not considered investment recommendations. Tim Dory's participation in Biotech Insights is separate and apart from his role as an investment advisor representative. Nothing contained herein can be construed as a recommendation or endorsement of any of the companies discussed. Tim Doherty also has no financial affiliation with any of the companies mentioned in this communication. Tim Doherty makes no representation that the information contained in this material is accurate and is under no obligation to update this information as changes occur.